And so um, I'd like to just, you know, start off, let's see here. Um, you know, one of the great things about ecology and evolution, uh, about studying nature is the incredible diversity, you know? So there's all these amazing species um, spanning this, you know, uh, tree of life, this enormous tree of life. Uh, and that makes it, you know, very exciting to study. Um, we, we can also study different, different systems in, in, in ecology, you know, whether they're soils, whether they're deserts, whether they're coral reefs, we can look at animals, we can look at plants or microbes. And we can also attack, you know, the, the, the study of nature from, from different levels, you know, for, from the individual, you know, physiological ecology, say, to, to populations, communities, ecosystems. Um, so there's this incredible richness and diversity to, you know, ecology as a field, the field I'm in, uh, and the study of it. But then this, this incredible diversity poses challenges for understanding general patterns. You know, for instance, we're still asking the question, how do species coexist? And, and what are the causes of diversity, you know, such as the latitudinal diversity gradient? Um, what are the major, major trends over time in organismal biology and why are they occurring? Um, and, and, and this, you know, are there organizing principles to, to the way nature is constructed uh, and, and occurs? And, and this, uh, this kind of question um, is kind of the, the challenges are underscored by um, the, you know, the threat that so many species are, are, are facing now. Um, and we, we can't afford to study every species by themselves. It would be nice if we had some general rules for how nature is organized and what are the causes uh, and consequences of, of biodiversity. So what I'm kind of proposing, well, not, no, I'm not the only one, um, what I've kind of um, you know, attached myself to is a kind of a metabolic lens that I think can be an organizing principle in ecology that can shed a lot of insight into how, how species and communities operate. And so and metabolism is the kind of processing of energy and materials from the environment in an organism to sustain life. And so all organisms use energy, whether it's light or chemical energy and food, um, to ultimately generate ATP. And then ATP powers all these chemical reactions that are occurring in the body. And then they allow the organism to do things like maintain its existence, to grow, to reproduce, to have activity and resource uptake. And these activity rates then power ecological interactions. And, and that especially is an area of interest for me, which hasn't gotten quite the same attention from metabolic folks as say growth and reproduction. And, you know, the rate at which this, this metabolism occurring in, in some ways sets the pace of life, you know, so um, we can measure this kind of metabolic rate uh, as the flux of oxygen, because oxygen is required in aerobic respiration to create ATP. And this metabolic rate is, um, it's going to affect things like how fast you grow. So there's these clean relationships between growth rate and metabolic rate, your rate of reproduction, the, 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 the speed at which you grow will affect then your time to first reproduction, which will affect your lifespan. So, so lots of biological times and, and rates, it'll affect how, 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 um, the amount of food that you need to eat. So this will affect then foraging interactions and resource uptake. Um, and so I'm really interested in how variation in metabolic rate is affecting a broader patterns of biological organization and diversity. And so one of the kind of first things to understand about, you know, metabolic rate in terms of patterns and processes is that it scales with body size. So it kind of has this predictable shift of body size that can follow a power law and on a log log plot, these are straight lines. Uh, and it's a really consistent pattern. Um, little things have fewer cells and use less energy. And the bigger things have more cells and they use more energy uh, in a particular kind of slope, um, a particular rate. But then 
for a given body size, there's a lot of interesting, really biologically significant uh, meaning to, to deviate to, to the variation in metabolic rate. So for instance, if we are studying vertebrates, um, there's about a tenfold, you know, five to hundred fold difference in um, the metabolic rate of things like lizards and fish versus warm blooded animals like mammals and birds. Um, and so these warm blooded endotherms and cold blooded ectotherms have very different kind of ways of living. And this is reflected in their metabolic rate. Um, so that's at an organismal level, but then metabolic rate can tell us a lot also at higher scale. So for instance, um, how, uh, how many organisms fit in an environment is in many ways a reflection of the resource requirements they need, which reflects their metabolic rate. So there's always going to be, you know, fewer big trees in a forest than, than little trees. And, you know, in the, in, in the healthy wild populations will get fewer uh, large animals than small animals. And the rate at which you have um, fewer large organisms is actually reflective of the rate at which their metabolism is going up. So you can just imagine at carrying capacity, all the organisms are using the available resources they need. And if a species needs more, then you can, uh, then you can only have, then you can fit fewer species, uh, fewer I individuals in, in, that, in that area. So the, the carrying capacity will shrink. And so this kind of you know, constraint of, of metabolism on abundance is an example of how this organismal process informs larger scale processes, larger organizational levels in ecology. So I think this you know, the idea of energy and metabolism is an organizing principle in biology. And, and with a metabolic lens, we can kind of knit together some of these organizational levels, but also address kind of particular longstanding questions in different disciplines. And so um, I'm gonna hit a few themes of kind of disciplines and questions that uh, cut across um, these kind of basic dimensions of ecology. And so one is looking in, 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 in uh, is, is, is looking at biology in deep time, looking for organismal patterns in deep time. Um, and one really successful ecologically important uh, taxa were, were dinosaurs, which dominated the Mesozoic systems for over 100 million years. Um, and then, of course, you know, a related lineage birds have still been very successful. But the, the, the Mesozoic dinosaurs um, have captured the interest of both you know, public and scientists. And one big question is, why were they successful? And, 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 and how did they live? And you know, uh, this is kind of boiled down to the question of, were they warm-blooded or cold-blooded? So you know, initially, dinosaurs were thought as these overgrown reptiles um, that kind of lumbered about. Um, but then, you know, with recent evidence, we changed their anatomical postures. They're leaning forward or they're a little more active. Uh, we found feathers. Um, and, you know, the kind of weight of opinion and evidence has shifted more towards being active, warm blooded. I don't know what's going on with my clock. Um, I'm going to hide. I'm going to hide my phone. I don't know. If the alarm is misbehaving. I should turn my phone off. Um, warm blooded endothermic. Uh, animal. I, I, I apologize here. Um, just turn the phone off. So um, what does that mean? You know, so just to kind of recap, probably most of you are familiar with these terms, ectotherms are things like lizards and fish that rely on external heat to kind of warm their bodies and they can either bask or they can mash the ambient. Um, and this is because they have a slow metabolic rate and one of the kind of outputs of metabolic processes is heat production. So they don't produce a lot of heat. They don't have insulation. Uh, and they tend to have a, 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 a much more limited activity levels. But there's a big benefit to being an ectotherm uh, with a slow metabolism. And that's, the, that's that you need to eat less food. So you, you can tolerate going without food for a longer time. And in contrast, endotherms like mammals and birds are just the opposite. They, they, they rely on, you know, they produce, metabolically produce a lot of heat, they capture it with fur, 
and they kind of have a constant body temperature. And if they get cold, they bump up their metabolic rate to kind of maintain this thermal set point that they, that they like. And there's a lot of benefits in terms of growing faster and moving faster, um, but the cost is that you need to eat a lot more. And the, the debate on the dinosaur biology has been uh, a little bit stymied by looking for these qualitative markers, you know, whether there's nasal turbinates, um, you know, the, 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 the cell structure of bones. And certainly the feathers seems relevant, but not all dinosaurs had feathers. Major lineages don't seem to have any feathers at all. So it was kind of a breakthrough when in the early 2000s, people realized we can get a kind of quantitative metabolic metric of dinosaurs by slicing up their bones like, like a tree ring. We can count the rings and age them. And then the size of these bones, the size of the rings tells us how much weight they're supporting. So we can put that together and figure out their body mass over their lifespan and get a growth curve. And a typical growth curve is this S-shaped curve. You start slow, you speed up, and then you slow down again. And then we can compare that to, to other dinosaurs, but also to mammals and birds and reptiles. Now, this, there's a lot of different growth rates along the curve, but if we can standardize it by picking the steepest part of the curve and getting the maximum growth rate. And so work, you know, uh, preliminary work kind of made some comparisons, but they were relying on pretty old data sets from the 70s. Uh, and so what I did in my PhD was update that. I collected over 200 species that was, I can't remember the number, but many thousands of data points. And then each point was a maximum growth rate for that species, uh, as well as synthesize all the available dinosaur data out there. Um, and so we see, again, for a given body size, you know, moving on the, the, the right axis, you know, so, you know, 10 to the zeros, it, it is one gram and 10 to is 100 grams, et cetera. Um, bigger animals use, bigger animals have a higher maximum growth rate. Um, so that, 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 that's, that's not new, but then we see this clear difference between warm-blooded endotherms and cold-blooded ectotherms, about a tenfold difference. I went in here thinking dinosaurs might be, you know, a good, a good warm-blooded endotherm. Um, I was a little bit surprised when, you know, these gray dots uh, up top of the dinosaurs, they kind of fell in between. Um, and you can see on the bottom line, you know, these different regression lines for different taxonomic groups. There's some variation, but there's a consistent endotherm ectotherm difference. And again, dinosaurs kind of fell in the middle. Um, and they overlap with a kind of group of thermally intermediate species uh, like tuna. Um, so if we divided out the, the effects of body size, if we kind of you know, remove that, the, the kind of mass normalized metabolic rate, uh, and we add a metabolic rate data and we add a growth rate data, what you basically see is that there's a cluster of fast metabolizing, fast growing things in red, and those are the endotherms. And there's some interesting variation between them. So things like primates, a lot of toothed whales, they grow relatively slow for, for their metabolism and altricial birds are relatively fast but they're kind of you know, in this quadrat, this upper quadrat. And as you move down, as your metabolic rate and growth rate slows, you become, you basically find a lot of ectotherms. And if you moved into the cold polar regions, it just gets even slower, uh, slower metabolism, slower growth. But in between these two groups um, are things that sometimes are called warm blooded, but are really different in, in special ways. Um, so, you know, for instance, tuna, they elevate their body temperature through metabolic means. Um, but if they get cold, their metabolic rate drops, their body temperature drops. They don't kind of keep it up like a, like a mammal or bird. Uh, and so when they dive deep into the, you know, deeper parts of the ocean to catch food, their metabolism drops as well. When they're born, they're very ectothermic-like. Uh, they match ambient, you know. Uh, and then as they get bigger and get more thermal inertia, they change. And dinosaurs overlaid with these mesotherms, I decided to call them, uh, a little prompt from my advisor. Um, and, uh, you know, so, okay, so, we, so, so the argument that I made is then that, you know, there are these intermediate kind of states uh, between, you know, your red and blue endotherms and ectotherms. And the dinosaurs, at least some of these dinosaurs, were probably good mesotherms. 
particularly the ones without feathers, although they all had this intermediate growth rate. Um, and again, you know, to reiterate, uh, it does seem to be like a real pattern. We see this in a lot of groups. So there's tuna, there's mako sharks, there's a leatherback sea turtle. The borderline case is the echidna, which has very variable body temperatures, doesn't seem to regulate it very well. But the key thing is they metabolically elevate their body temp, but they don't metabolically defend a kind of particular set point. Now they have ways of conserving heat, they have counter current circulation, um, but they're not boosting their metabolic rate when they get cold like a mammal or bird. So it's more variable and they generally have intermediate metabolic rates. So, you know, we have this successful dinosaur lineage and you know, if I extrapolate a little bit, I think this elevated metabolism compared to ectotherm competitor, competitors allows them to be more active and potentially better competitors and predators. There's a lot of, you know, active capture pursuit you're being pursued when you're a large vertebrate and you're very visible. Uh, on the other hand, having a slightly lower metabolic rate than a mammal probably allowed them to get bigger because there are these resource constraints on maximum size. So if you go from a mainland to, to an island, you know, <laughs> elephants tend to dwarf. Um, and so you, you have, um, you know, this is probably a big factor arguably in the kind of success of dinosaurs. And certainly it gets to the heart of a major debate in the field. But then after, you know, I did this work, it really got me thinking, well, what is the kind of ecological evolutionary value of mesothermy? And more broadly of this different thermoregulatory and metabolic variation. You know, are there consequences of a kind of a, a focus on metabolism and, and thermoregulation for, for patterns of spatial diversity? Um, and the short answer is yes, but let's find out. So what's neat about the ocean, which I decided to look at, is you have a lot of phylogenetic uh, and metabolic diversity among things that are kind of competing for the same food. So, you know, whether there are, you know, thresher sharks or landed sharks, uh, you have tuna, you have marlin. Some of these are heating up their whole core. Others like marlin are heating up their eyes or their brain which allows them to actually process visual information faster. Um, you have a lot of endotherms that have invaded the sea, you know, penguins and puffins and cetaceans and seals and sea lions. And then they're often, you know, they're almost all eating cold-blooded fish and squid. So there's a lot of cross thermoregulatory interactions. Um, there's competition between these groups. And there's predation even, even among potential competitors, depending on their life stage. So there's a lot of antagonistic interactions. There isn't as much freezing, which could affect thermal tolerance in ectotherms. It's just, you know, these gradients of temperature, uh, which does affect metabolic rate and thermoregulation. And there's a, you know, I thought there would be a great scope for really exploring these themes. And, um, you know, I had some ideas that these differences in metabolic rate um, might have some consequences on diversity. Uh, and the first place I kind of looked to get a lay of the land was uh, to look you know, um, to the articles of the great Derek Tinsor and Boris Worm, uh, a nature paper, 2010, really kind of laid out these patterns of diversity. And they're about what you'd expect in that um, these, uh, you know, life uh, tends to get more diverse in, in warm tropical areas, in productive and spatially complex areas like coral reefs. Um, and that's exactly what we see in the ocean. The Indo-Pacific near Australia has a lot of islands and that's probably kind of a boon for all the coastal life. But things like fish diversity and lots of other metrics, they're going up there. Um, but you know, there's a bit of a thermoregulatory signal in that you know, pinnipeds, a good warm blood animal, very different pattern of diversity uh, in much colder areas. Now cetaceans seem to fit it, but about half of all cetacean species are dolphins, uh, which have very unique uh, foraging strategies uh, and may not be representative of other endotherm lineages. And then there weren't, you know, penguins and puffins, which I think we all have a sense that are pretty cold, uh, you know, kind of uh, find them in cold habitats. So I, I decided to do a, a, a synthesis um, of 
but you know, there's more and more data, data coming out where these things live. Uh, I kind of increased the sample size about a thousand large vertebrate species, kind of shrunk the grid cells so 110, 110 kilometers. That's about one degree lat long. Uh, uh, contacted Kristen Kashner, who um, has all this data on the global abundance uh, and consumption rates of pinnipeds and, and cetaceans. So we could look at kind of flux, you know, metabolic flux of energy and biomass over space. Um, I added more metabolic data. Uh, to look at differences between these groups that I thought would be relevant and try to bake in a theoretical framework. So, you know, one of the kind of motivating theoretical ideas I had for looking at these was that you know, if we just boil down what's different between endotherm and ectotherm, uh, say over, you know, over the globe, we know that there are these kind of latitudinal gradients in water temperature. And we know that water temperature is a big deal for ectotherms. They had these exponential increases in their metabolic rate, but also um, presumably in things like their, their locomotory rate. Um, and so, you know, but if you're an endotherm, you take your body temperature with you and your metabolic rate's not really changing as long as you're not too stressed, your locomotion's not really changing. And so there's this asymmetry in the kind of thermal response. And I thought this could be ecologically important in that, um, you know, if you're a, a seal or a dolphin or a penguin and you're trying to catch a fish, in the cold, fish are slower and it'd be easier to catch a slow fish. Or if you're trying to avoid a shark, in the cold, sharks are slower, it's easier to avoid a shark. And then vice versa, as it warms up, um, your prey becomes faster, your predators become faster. And so all things being equal, there should be these thermodynamic advantages to foraging and to surviving in the cold. And it kind of fit an intuition they had that, you know, if you hopped on the Beagle with Darwin and you traveled around their earth, uh, you'd stop at a coral reef, you'd see lots of these, you know, sharks and big fish, and then you stopped it, you made your way to the poles, things like penguins and seals show up. Um, so to kind of really test this uh, with more detail, I basically, um, you know, I download a lot of maps of range, you know, species, range distributions, and you can overlay them and count the diversity. And here, just darker blue or darker colors means more species. This is a log scale, so you're increasing, you're, you're doubling every time it gets a little darker. Um, a lot of these are coastal species, so they don't show up in the open ocean, but then sharks, there are some, you know, everywhere. But there's a similar pattern, whether you're looking at sharks or groupers or jacks. Um, there's higher diversity in kind of the warm temperate subtropics and tropics. And it's higher near the coast. It's higher in the Indo-Pacific. Um, that's true also barracuda, whether you're looking at bonitos or even sea snakes. Um, there is kind of these similar, you know, warm water coastal trends of diversity. But it's just the opposite in a lot of your endotherms. So, you know, whether it's ox and puffins in the northern hemisphere, that's the Alcid family, Alcidae family, whether it's penguins in the southern hemisphere, they almost look like a mirror image of each other, kind of flipped. Then seals, you know, they kind of look like you combine the puffins and the penguins, very polar and cold temperate. The sea lions at first, as they venture out a little further, but it's still very cold water systems. Porpoises show up, you know, throughout the globe, but their biggest distributions, again, are in cold water. Uh, and the one exception to the rule uh, is this really diverse dolphin family, oceanic dolphins, um, which I'm gonna kind of touch on more uh, than the line. But if we move over to mesotherms, uh, again, these billfish, they're heating just organs in their body, but um, they are metabolically heating parts of the body, tuning its whole body. And they both have these very oceanic distributions, widely distributed. And this is also true of your mackerel sharks. So mako sharks kind of roam the ocean. Um, uh, gray whites kind of migrate over the ocean. And then you know, there are thresher sharks that range from heating their core to organs. And they're also very widely distributed, very different than other sharks, which are very coastal. And so um, we have this data there. Uh, I also collected a lot of data on, um, you know, the metabolic rates of these organisms. I had this idea that there's this basic asymmetry and it wouldn't just be metabolic rate, it would be speed. And I collected data on burst speed, your maximum speed. 
And indeed, this kind of asymmetry is observed. There's some interesting taxonomic variation. Dolphins are going, you know, seven or eight meters a second at, at their peak, and pinnipeds and penguins are closer to four meters a second. Um, but there's this kind of uh, consistent asymmetry here. And we can, you know, apply some theory to the rate in which the ectotherms are increasing uh, using some kind of chemical kinetics no no notation, the Boltzmann factor, but it roughly it's two to three times per 10 Celsius. Um, and then I kind of looked at other, other metabolic rates that might be relevant for ecological interactions and for the generality of this principle. So acceleration, uh, routine speed, there's a whole body, I have muscle contraction rates, I have um, you know, rates at which the eyes are moving and processing information, the rates at which your brain is firing. They all have these strong kind of thermal signals, um, you know, close to this, you know, canonical E value of 0.65, but some of them are higher and some of them are lower. But they're all really responsive to temperature. So there is a metabolic asymmetry. Um, and then what I wanted to do was kind of synthesize all this um, uh, diversity data and put it together. And uh, one of the thoughts I had was to kind of overlay, um, you know, to, as a direct comparison of what species doing, I took the ratio of warm blooded to cold blooded richness. So, you know, whether there's, uh, so imagine if there's equal numbers of ectotherms and endotherms in a given uh, 110 grid, then the value would be one. Uh, in these dark red areas, there's 16 times more endotherms than ectotherms. That's dark red. In the blue areas, there's four times more ectotherms than endotherms. Um, and what we're seeing is a really clear, so, so one advantage is it's a very direct comparison. You could imagine endotherms increasing in the tropics, but not as fast as ectotherms. And you might not appreciate that there's a difference, but you'd see it in the ratio. Or there's areas where everyone's diversity falls, like in the Mediterranean, it's a little isolated. But if you look at the relative difference, the kind of general pattern is conserved. So whether there's fluctuations in productivity that have general effects on everybody, you know, you get, we have a very direct measure of kind of relative diversity. And the patterns really pop out. The ectotherms are relatively more diverse in these coastal tropics, and the endotherms increase towards the poles even including dolphins. Um, uh, and so you know, if we plotted that out, we could easily fit uh, kind of uh, a parabolic, you know, quadratic fit to, to latitude. And I kind of distinguished coastal versus oceanic. Um, and we could also, uh, then we could kind of put a, fit a straight line to temperature uh, with that as well. Um, so I looked at other environmental predictors. I've been talking a lot about temperature, but there really isn't a latitudinal gradient in other predictors. Uh, the more recent models of net primate production do not show a strong latitudinal gradient. Um, and really only temperature is predictive. And then I wanted to build a model linking, you know, this organismal level to these kind of global patterns. Uh, and so speed is a key component of a lot of foraging models. It's going to affect the rate at which species uh, encounter each other. Imagine um, molecules bouncing around. The faster they're moving, the more likely they are to you know, bounce into each other. Uh, and so you can model with Brownian motion or get more sophisticated, but faster movement is going to increase uh, the likelihood of encounter. And endotherms are going to be, you know, their speed is not changing much. As the faster predator, they're going to dominate this um, speed term, this relative speed term. Uh, when you apply these models. But then that's not the only component of capture. The relative difference between predator and prey should affect the capture per encounter or the capture efficiency. Uh, and that's going to be a very different temperature dependence. For endotherms, which are going to be more successful in the cold than for an ectotherm, um, so I'm looking at my middle pattern uh, panel, and the ectotherm, which you know everyone warms up or cools down if you're a shark within a fish chasing a fish. There's not a real temperature effect. And so we can multiply together and get kind of this maximum capture rate capacity. And the argument I had is that uh, for given amount of food, more of it's fluxing through the, the animal that's better at capturing food. So as 
the endotherms are relatively more successful capturing prey than ectotherms, they should be capturing relatively more prey. And so they're fluxing more through them and their abundance is shifting. Now they can't eat more food than exists. So that's kind of like a carrying capacity. So there's a, a, a logistic formulation to this, but you can do a loader transformation and kind of make this a linear fit um, and control for prey production. And we can kind of build in some expectations on the thermal sensitivities of these components and then make some testable predictions. Uh, and so we have the data um, on odontocy. Those are tooth whales. Uh, you use small tooth whales and pinniped abundance. As you see, there's also this clear latitudinal gradient. It's not just um, richness, um, whether you're looking at abundance or consumption. And then if we plotted this out against temperature, it's a little curvilinear, uh, but that partly reflects variation in food supply. Um, and so we can divide through by primary production as a kind of proxy for prey production. Uh, I also looked at zooplankton production, um, some modeling estimates of that and was, you know, similar results. Um, the predicted slope of this was between 0.65 and 1.3. Um, I can take my equation, make it into a kind of a, a, a y-intercept format where the slope tells me the key parameter. And um, 0.65 to 1.3 is the parameter prediction and the observed was 1.05. So it fit the prediction. Uh, it's explaining 80% of the variation in consumption. And kind of what it's showing is that there's an 80-fold increase in how much of the available production you're getting as a mammal. So uh, it's not just absolute amount of food, it's the proportion you're actually capturing that's changing uh, as food becomes more effectively available. That's my argument as prey becomes easier to capture. So that was kind of like the big take home message. Uh, that's my, you know, so ultimately this shift in energy flux is driving patterns of diversity. Um, but there's an interesting, you know, other pattern which is across space from coastal oceanic that I didn't really explore in that paper. Um, and what you're noticing, the, you know, these endotherms are mostly just dolphins. Um, so, you know, what's going on? Um, you know, what's going on? Why are, why are the open oceans dominated by dolphins and dominated by tuna and mesotherms? So one thing that jumps out is that tuna and billfish are really fast. They're among the fastest fish and then dolphins are among the fastest. Um, marine mammal that swim. Uh, you have some diving things that can enter the water at high speed and some of them do show up in the tropics. But among swimming um, marine mammals and birds, dolphins are the fastest. They also work together to herd fish in the ball. So if you have a fast moving kind of fish school, but you herd it together and condense it and shove it up to the, push it up to the surface waters where it can't move, you effectively reduce the speed of your prey and made it easier to capture. So I think when we're trying to understand these big scale patterns, kind of two other key components um, uh, that kind of I'm working on cooperating now, it's this openness, well, sorry, so co cooperative foraging of, you know, as I mentioned, dolphins, and then the openness of the habitat. So if a dolphin's chasing a fish over a coral reef, a fish can easily dart into the coral and it's hard to capture. So all this kind of, high metabolism that's costly and allows dolphins to be fast, it doesn't really pay off in a structurally complex habitat where prey can easily hide or dart into a refuge. And it's more advantageous uh, in the kind of open, high visibility uh, upper parts of the ocean where things can't hide and you, there's a lot of stamina and pursuit at stake. So, you know, my general argument is this relative richness is linked to relative metabolic rate, but it's also going to be a function of openness and cooperation. Um, and openness, you know, there's different ways to try to, you know, what I mean is how structurally complex with, as you go to the coastal areas and there's more benthic habitat, things get more complex. In addition, visibility often goes down because there's more phytoplankton. Uh, and so the kind of high visibility open ocean open waters of the, you know, open ocean systems are shifting more towards, you know, being ectothermic or slower. Um, and so what I, you know, so I'm kind of in the process, I increased my sample size 
uh, using fish-based aquamaps. I can make some kind of size criteria on who's a relevant competitor to mammals. Um, and then I use ocean depth as a proxy for habitat openness. Uh, it's not just distance to land because some really shallow water systems uh, with, with benthic and they're getting light, they're actually below the surfaces and you get a lot of coastal fish showing up there. So if you use you know, ocean depth as this proxy, you see this kind of consistent shift from, from um, ectotherm dominated in shallow coastal areas to endotherm as you go um, into more open systems. And the same thing's happening with mesotherms. And I could also show the same pattern if I just looked at bony fish or just at sharks. Um, and then I have a lot of points you know, at the one ocean depth. That's basically things that are contiguous to land. And I just made them transparent so you could see the range, but also kind of where most points are falling. And it kind of fits the general pattern. And then if I wanted to look at, say, these cooperative dolphins versus your solitary pinnipeds, um, I wanted to compare how, how they're, how, how they're you know, collecting resources in the ocean. Uh, if these fish are getting harder to capture in the tropics, then both speed and cooperation is a way of dealing with that, then you should get this kind of consistent shift. Um, and there's some wiggling, but there's this relatively consistent shift between um, you know, dolphins are only, are 10 times, consuming 10 times less food at, you know, one Celsius to consuming about 10 times more food uh, at 25 Celsius. So there is this consistent shift in flux between these different foraging strategies. So behavior does matter in these systems. Um, now, you know, I focus on the ocean with a lot of competitive interactions, but there is some uh, suggestion that this pattern is really general. So uh, I was able to get a hold of some data set on all lizard diversity. Um, mammals have been around for a while, but lizards kind of was, you know, the last couple of years it came out. And they're not always competing with each other, but there are a lot of trophic interactions between mammals uh, and lizards and mammals and ectotherms in general. Um, and what we're seeing, you know, conventionally we think of everything peaking in the tropics, but when we actually plot this ratio, we have this relative measure, we see this other really consistent pattern, which is this really clear shift in relative diversity um, from, you know, from, from endotherm dominated in the cold to ectotherm in the warm. And it's related to temperature. If you, if you can see in the upper panel, the Himalayas are bright red, higher elevation area. And so if I plot it, we see the same shift, you know, with latitude that we saw in the ocean and the same shift with temperature. And one thing I'll point out is this, this the slope of this line in C, uh, the rate at which it's, you know, shifting from mammal to, to lizard dominated is almost identical to the slope of metabolic rate with temperature. So I think relative differences in metabolism is this kind of toggle um, that's changing patterns of diversity between uh, these interacting thermoregulatory groups like mammals and snakes. So um, kind of explore this more in a follow-up, but it does suggest this is a very general idea. And it's not just across groups, but it's also within. So one of the biggest mammal families are shrews. Shrews are a little bit like seals and, and and uh, penguins in that they're eating cold-blooded prey. They're eating worms and insects. And what we see is this real spatial pattern in um, the, uh, the distribution of different shrew subfamilies. The red-toothed ones have a double, you know, have twice the metabolic rate of these white-toothed shrews, Crocigerinae, and they're distributed in these cold areas, despite the thermal cost, uh, but where prey is presumably much easier to capture and you can support a high metabolism. And then the converse is true. As you move to deserts and you move to warm areas, these lower metabolizing shrews take over. And if I were to plot the average metabolic rate over space, kind of averaging these different species, we see a latitudinal gradient just like um, what we saw before. I forgot to add that, but uh, it's true. And so, um, you know, Stepping back uh, away from kind of pure science and thinking more applied, uh, say about conservation, I think these have some kind of important implications. 
you know, we focus a lot on, you know, thermal tolerance, physiological tolerance, or food supply, um, habitat availability, and dictating how animals respond to climate change. But I think interactions between the two is, is just as important. And what this metabolic asymmetry tells us is that um, species um, that are interacting, that it's more favorable for an endotherm in cold than it is for an ectotherm. Uh, and so uh, a good example of this is the Barren Sea where I think the harp seal and cod are competing for capelin fish. It's been warming uh, quite a bit there and the capelin numbers have actually been surging. So you might think both, both predators would benefit, um, but it turns out the cod have really done great, whereas the, um, the harp seal have actually plunged in, in, in abundance. So I think this will probably be a common trend. We have shifts in uh, not, not just <laughs> distribution, but, but a, a abundance of many of these species, especially endotherms as, as things warm up. So that's kind of my um, you know, macroecological uh, application of kind of metabolic rates and metabolic framework. Um, but one of the kind of critiques of this kind of metabolic approach to ecology is it maybe it works well in linking organisms to ecosystems uh, or to the globe, but, but what about in communities where a lot of ecologists you know, really care about processes? So, so David Tillman, the great David Tillman, uh, thought it was a matter of scale and it didn't really apply to community ecology. Now he is a plant biologist and another plant biologist like Brian Enquist would say, well, wait a minute, you know, it does have something to say. Uh, one of these kind of key concepts in metabolic ecology that I alluded to earlier is that um, the rate at which individuals are respiring or growing, so in the upper panel, it's increasing with size and that in turn is kind of affecting the rate at which they're getting rarer with size. And so, you know, a slope of two in a log axis means for a tenfold increase in stem diameter, you're getting uh, uh, a hundredfold increase in growth rate or a hundredfold decline in how abundant you are per hectare per size class, so per centimeter. Um, so if we added up all the individuals in a hectare between one and two centimeters or 10 and 11 centimeters diameter at breast height or 100 and 101, um, there's this consistent shift in abundance. And because they offset each other, if we were to sum up all the growth rates and get the kind of production in these size classes, so between one and two centimeters, between 10 and 11, between 100 and 101, they'd actually be producing collectively the equal amounts of, of wood, of new growth. And that's an idea called energy equivalence. Um, so it would be kind of a biomass, a production equivalence with with growth, it's energy, if it's respiration, but it's this kind of this basic idea. And this is telling us about the size structure of forest. Abundance is a key you know, thing that people care about in community ecology. So there's some, you know, has something to say there, but I think we can say a lot more. Um, you know, a lot of community ecologists are not just concerned with differences in size and abundance. And in, especially in a forest, we have incredible, highly resolved data on where everybody lives. Of course, their size and then size over time. So we get the growth rate. We have other trait data um, because we know with our location, we can estimate how much light they're getting. Um, and so we can actually get our resources. And so I think there's a credible opportunity to integrate trait data and resource availability uh, into a kind of a scaling framework, uh, especially because things like light availability probably is scaling with size as you get taller and closer to the canopy. And so um, one of the most kind of consistent trait differences in forests that um, people, people have studied are, you know, whether you're shade tolerant or a gap specialist that can't tolerate shade and grows in kind of a canopy gap when a tree blows over. Um, you know, in Canada, you might think of, um, you know, these shade tolerant climax trees like a sugar maple or a hemlock or a beech. And then uh, the gap specialist is a bit more of a tropical thing, but there are these kind of um, fast growing short lived trees like aspen and um, paper birch. And, and this kind of shade tolerant gap specialist falls along this kind of broader life history 
um, syndrome known as a fast, slow continuum. You live fast and die young. You grow up really quickly, reproduce and die, or do you live slow and die old? And these slow living trees are shade tolerant. They have denser wood, they live longer. And there's a metabolic link to this life history. And that's at the energetics of the leaf. So these fast trees have a lot of nitrogen phosphorus for protein synthesis, for uh, chlorophyll, uh, chloroplast, and that allows for higher max assimilation when there is light. They can assimilate a lot of carbon uh, uh, for growth, but they respire, they have high dark respiration. So these things are metabolically expensive and that's partly why they can't tolerate shade. It's kind of like an endothermic mammal that needs to eat a lot. It can do a lot, it can grow fast with food, but if it doesn't get it, it runs a deficit, an energy deficit. And then these kind of slow trees have leaves that are, have the opposite properties. And this has led to this kind of widespread trade-off between growth and mortality that characterizes the fast slow continuum. So if we go back to our kind of scaling framework, um, we know that light is declining. There's studies showing light declines about 2% of kind of the, the peak intensity above the canopy when it gets to the forest floor. So things that are sensitive to light, like our gaff specialists, fast trees, um, probably would be affected, you know, at the lower end. So if we want to move beyond just what, you know, um, everybody's doing and think about the role of traits and functional differences, we can incorporate that and we can make some predictions. So maybe these fast trees uh, have, are deviating from the line, the low end, uh, pushed off so that their slopes are higher or lower, uh, depending on what we're looking at, they're less abundant in the shade at small sizes. And instead of following an energy equivalence and C, light limitation is causing them to, to deviate from it quite a bit. So we can kind of move beyond just um, size only look at say communities. But then, you know, shade tolerant things should be less affected by the shade in the understory. So they might have very different slopes, uh, very different patterns of abundance. And so there could be some demographic turnover occurring with size. And in a scaling framework, we can look for that. Um, so what I did was uh, I collaborated with Nadja Ruger, who's looked at a lot of life histories. I identified all these species on this fast slow continuum. Uh, that's on the x-axis. There's an additional axis she identified where um, this kind of stature recruitment, you have tall uh, kind of long lived pioneers, she calls them that get really large stature, they grow quickly, they don't die, uh, but they re re recruit very poorly. And the opposite true is of these shorter shrubs and small trees that recruit great, but then die easily and grow, grow slowly. And so I could look at all these groups and then in the middle of the medium, um, and I can kind of compare patterns and seeing how they're diverging or converging on these kind of generic macroecological patterns. And so here each point is the average value in a size class. So it's the average growth rate or it's the summed abundance over a size class. Um, and so and growth rates are actually very similar, but there's a lot of divergence in abundance. These uh, so all is kind of the sum of everybody that's in black, um, the dark blue or the slow, they're kind of dominating everything for a while. But as they get bigger and they cross 10 centimeters, they're converging in abundance with these kind of tall, uh, these green guys, these tall and fast. Both of these are similar. They're kind of green because they're, they're demographically responsive to light. So I don't show this, but they grow faster in high light. They're more sensitive to high light and they, they live their, their mortality drops more in low light. So these are the ones that you might expect to be changing the most with light. And indeed they are, as you get bigger, uh, there's a real convergence. And so in terms of energy equivalence, no one really meets it at the smallest and biggest sizes. And this is actually pretty typical. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, this is in Barrow, Colorado Island, I apologize. 114,000 species. Uh, this is over 10 years, but you can get multiple years worth of data. Um, and anyway, you see energy equivalents close to it at the stand level and in the slow, but strong deviation um, in other groups. And it's not just differences in production, but something community colleagues care about is resource use. 
and we could estimate light capture in every individual because we know what its, what its neighbor's doing or how much light is kind of filtering through a, can, a, a crown. And then uh, we can see whether we're getting things like a, a resource or solar energy equivalents um, and whether this kind of metabolic rates like production respiration are tracking resource use, which is ultimately fueling it. And indeed we do, we see a solar kind of equivalence and um, no matter what group I look at, you know, I plot the slope in D um, at the intermediate rates. And so like the blue ones are pretty flat. They're very close to zero. If you look at slow, they're close to zero, whether it's solar, light capture or production, other ones diverge. But in each case, you know, the, the total growth and total light capture are very similar in all these groups. So this kind of metabolic framework can tell us now about resource use and resource use with size. And it suggests that there's a strong demographic turnover with size. And this gets to another major issue in community ecology, the role of niches uh, in kind of mitigating competition, promoting coexistence, or species more neutral. And it's kind of assumed that these gap specialist shade tolerant has strong niche differences and partition light gradients. But Stephen Hubble, the architect of neutral theory, at BCI, the island I was collecting data from, uh, or using data, his data, in fact, um, it's a 50 hectare plot. Everything's been measured above two centimeters diameter breast height. So saplings and up. So this is massive data set. And he looked at relative abundance of gap specialists and shade tolerant um, over kind of these gaps in the forest, focusing on the saplings. Um, and everybody gets more abundant in a, in, a, in a gap where there's a lot of light, but is the relative abundance shifting? If gap specialists have a competitive advantage, they should get more common. He found that there was no shift in relative abundance. So there's no evidence of niche partitioning. But a lot of these gaps are very stochastic. A lot of these shade tolerant or saplings are already established. They may be blocking gap specialists. But the most sustained shifts are kind of with size. So I thought if we apply a scaling framework, we might see these demographic shifts that are evidence of niche partitioning. And as I kind of showed you, um, there was changes in relative abundance. And if we do our ratios and do a direct comparison, what we see is this consistent shift in how much wood is being produced over a light gradient it's about a hundred fold shift from short to tall in A or um, a 30 fold shift from slow dominated to fast uh, in terms of how much wood's being produced. And the same pattern is occurring with abundance. You know, so it's going from short to tall, from small size to big sizes. And, uh, and then the same thing with these fast to slow. So if you were to kind of take a snapshot of the forest turn it into a multicolor psychedelic experience. Um, as you go from the forest floor to the, to the canopy, you're going, getting larger tree sizes, you're getting more light. And there's a shift in the relative production and abundance um, from these kind of short and slow to fast and tall. And at least with the slow and fast, it's a, short, it's a shift from slow metabolism to high metabolism as resources go up. So there's a commonality here, common theme in that in high resource environments, high performance, high metabolism organisms probably have a competitive edge. Um, and if we think about our marine system in a way temperature is affecting the effective productivity of the system, the effective availability of prey. And as prey become more available for them, they're having more ecological success. So if we were to summarize, I think this kind of metabolic approach, especially a focus on metabolic rate and their differences, could tell us kind of, can it help address major issues over deep time, such as how important taxa lived. Um, uh, they can help us understand the drivers of global patterns of diversity over space uh, at large scales, but also at small scales, and understand the kind of coexistence of different uh, niche partition, different species and the organization of communities. So with that, uh, I'll conclude, um, I'll say thank you to a lot of my collaborators, including Derek, 
um, a variety of people. I've worked with some funding. And if there is anyone still left, I'm happy to take questions.